Uh, well, good morning, everybody. This is Arthur Brandwood speaking. Um, welcome to our webinar this morning. I'm the uh, founder and a principal consultant at Brandwood Biomedical. And uh, with me on the line from our Beijing office today is uh, consultant uh, Junhua Shang, um, who um, supports um, our work in China. Um, I'll give the presentation and at the end, Junhua and I will, um, will take questions and answers. Um, the subject today, China's New Year resolutions. Abolish type testing, accept foreign clinical data, and conduct international inspections. Why do I say that? Um, a whole range of um, uh, announcements have been coming out of CFDA um, over the last um, uh, few months, and um, these three have been really top of the list. So let's just look at what's been going on in China. It was a crazy year last year. 2017, change became the new normal. Um, just to look at some of the things uh, that, that happened in terms of new announcements and new changes to the regulations in China. Fairly early in the year, um, the CFDA changed some of their processes to allow the Center for Medical Device Evaluation to make its own direct decisions. Previously, the process was that the application goes to CFDA, it sends it off to the CMDE, they do a review, they provide a recommendation, then it goes back to CFDA for a further review. Now, um, at least for renewals and some low risk decisions, CMDA is making its own direct decisions and chopping out the last review stage. And um, we expect that to be expended, extended in the future to a broader range of decisions. Um, in, I think, March, uh, there was an announcement, not by the CFDA, by a separate uh, government ministry um, of, of, of uh, abolition of a range of government fees. And when the announcement was made, there was a list of all sorts of things you, there were, uh, there were, uh, that were to be abolished. Um, you, the, the fees for water extraction from the Yangtze River, um, fees for certain agricultural licenses, and fees for medical device testing were all abolished. Um, that happened in March and led to quite a number of consequences, which we'll come back to in a moment. CFDA is hiring reviewers like crazy. CFDA is trying to increase its number of staff to deal with its workload. Um, and to illustrate that, um, this was last August when um, uh, we uh, gave a training course at the Center for Medical Device Engineering. Um, this was a specialist training course um, we were delivering on biocompatibility. And at the height of the um, the meeting, we did this for a full day with a bunch of experts from the ISO committee. Um, we had more than 100 new reviewers, or well, more than 100 reviewers, most of whom were new recruits to the organization here getting a training on biocompatibility evaluation. Um, large numbers of new reviewers, um, all requiring training. Um, so that's going to make some interesting times in terms of review practices as these reviewers get up to speed, expect some naive questions, that sort of thing. Um, Consultations, Open Window Thursday became Open Window Friday and got a bit restructured. So the agency is trying to deal with um, how applicants can go and consult and ask questions. Um, used to be Open Window Thursday is not a window, it's a room. Um, but you could go and ask um, at uh, a session organized where you take a ticket and you speak to a reviewer and ask some questions. That was closed, that arrangement. And then after many requests from the industry, it was re reopened, um, this time on a Friday with a slightly different structure to, to how that's done. But there is that opportunity for relatively informal consultations um, every week. Um, New review processes and guidance, lots of that happening um, uh, through the year. Um, and the aim is uh, CFDA is trying to streamline some of its administrative processes so that the reviews really focus on the technical matters. Um, multiple extensions to the clinical trial exemption list. Um, I think we're up to the third or the fourth wave now. Uh, about a thousand devices, including a couple of hundred IVDs, are now exempted from clinical trial requirements. Um, during the year, um, or the past year and a half really, uh, as part of um, China's program to update its body of medical device technical standards, there is a current program of um, 500 standards in five years. Um, in 2017 alone, 87 new and revised standards were published and 35 new guidances. A lot of work going on there. Um, 
The agency has been strengthening its domestic audits for several years and beginning to do international audits and a very small program. A few audits have been done, but um, as we'll come back to, that we're the, there's likely that that audit program is going to accelerate quite substantially. Um, middle of the year, there were a bunch of policy circulars um, put out on um, approaches to international clinical data and post-market trials and streamlining of processes. The post-market trial one was interesting, so um, they were um, floating the idea that for um, devices of high benefit where there may be limited clinical data, it may be an acceptable thing to, um, to uh, proceed to registration with a limited clinical data set but require a post-market trial um, and reporting to CFDA. That's a practice that's well established in a number of other jurisdictions and I think China's looking to follow suit. Um, there became uh, there was a new clinical trial site notifi notification process introduced. Um, previously, uh, you really had to do clinical trials at uh, sites which were um, approved by CFDA. Now they've gotten rid of that approval list, um, and they're looking to um, basically have sites notify them that they intend to do clinical trials, uh, and that the, but the sites must meet a, a set of objective criteria to be um, determined by CFDA. So that should expand the number of sites where it's easy to do clinical trials. Um, and um, a complete rewrite of the device classification catalog is underway. That was announced and the draft published in uh, about July, um, and that will be implemented August this year. So they're just some of the things. As I said, changes the new normal. It's almost breathtaking the number of announcements coming out of CFDA, and uh, the end of the year it just got faster. So um, here's the New Year's resolutions: three announcements at the end of October, end of November, and end of December. Um, the big one was the draft amendment to Order 650. This is the first major revision of the top-level device regulation, Order 650, and that included the proposal to abolish the requirement for mandatory in-China type testing. Um, the, the, uh, or the draft um, proposes that manufacturers can um, gain their test data from a wider range of sources, including international laboratories, um, as well as some in-house testing, um, or they can still adopt, they can still opt to do a type test in China. Um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the 30th of November, they announced a proposed uh, framework for acceptance of international clinical data um, with quite a lot of detail about how that would work. And uh, then right at the end of the year, on the 28th of December, they don't slow down for the Christmas New Year period. Um, uh, CFDA announced details of, an, of their new international manufacturer audit program. And we're going to talk about each of these three in a bit more detail. Let's start with the first one. Um, this is the Beijing Institute for Medical Testing. Um, it's one of the many uh, CFDA accredited type test centers uh, around the country. Um, we uh, certainly do quite a lot of work with this test center in Beijing for, for um, things like electromechanical testing. Um, at the moment, under Chinese law, you have to go to test centers. Um, you have to do a type test um, against a product technical requirement and the test report and test results form part of your application dossier. Um, in March, as I said, um, this announcement came out um, and a whole bunch of administrative fees were reduced or abolished, including medical device testing fees. So that's a good thing, less fees. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Um, not necessarily so. What actually happened was the laboratories um, now had no fee income to cover the cost of doing the testing. Um, there was no replacement of funding to do the testing, and the laboratories reacted in a number of ways. Some of them simply stopped taking new orders, stopped doing testing. Um, uh, the Shandong Test Center particularly um, shifted away from doing uh, registration testing um, to doing local testing for the province. So that test center, which is one of the main, one of the two big ones for doing biocompatibility testing, just stopped. Um, uh, the uh, BIMT stopped taking new orders. It processed existing 
orders in the system but stopped taking new orders. Um, some other test centers did things like um, suddenly requiring all sorts of additional information which really wasn't relevant but nonetheless slowed the process down, basically putting a roadblock in up front. The problem was that not only were they not getting fee income, um, some of the fee income was used for things like engineer bonuses and whatnot and so uh, suddenly there's no incentive to do things quickly. Um, the whole thing ground to a halt. It effectively amounted to a roadblock on type testing, which amounted to a roadblock on registrations because you can't proceed to registration. Um, so um, what the order now does um, it should address some of that situation. Um, the draft order, it's still a draft, um, abolishes mandatory in China testing. It, it now allows ma uh, manufacturers to uh, do their testing in any accredited laboratory um, and it does also contemplate a supply of in-house data, um, although we would expect that those test data need to be established and uh, derived from very well established control conditions. Um, However, you still need a product technical requirement. That's the document which drives the testing. It's the document that defines all the, the specifications and, uh, and performance requirements for the device. Um, and that's what you test against. And that's based on the current Chinese standards. You still need to have that document. That will still need to go into your registration submission. And you need to then have your test laboratory, wherever you choose to do this, test against the PTR. And that means you're effectively still testing for China uh, standards and guidances. Now, remember, the way to do this used to be that you go to the test center. And the process is that you um, test against the uh, China standard. Um, and you, um, you would have a conversation with with. Um, you would have a conversation with, with the laboratory. Um, about the requirements. So they were a useful sounding board. They, the labs themselves are experienced in what tests are required and how the, the agency would tend to react to that. And so um, that was a useful process. Now, um, there is no sounding board from the test center. You um, arrange the labs, uh, arrange the tests, and go straight to CFDA. So it raises a question about what is the experience of the international labs to test against um, Chinese standards. Um, and uh, you are also introducing a new risk where you don't have that experience sounding board of the test center. So it's still going to be quite interesting to see how this all plays out, but at least it opens up a whole lot more options. Um, it carried on. On the 3rd of January, um, there was this edict issued by um, the CFDA uh, a direction sent to all of the um, uh, regional and provincial FDAs and their test laboratories. And um, it's a fairly lengthy uh, missive, but here's a couple of quotes. It asked them to, um, and this is a, uh, a translated, of course, from the Mandarin, um, to smooth the complaint channels, earnestly listen to the relevant demands of manufacturers, and understand their practical difficulties and use some initiative. In other words, come on, people, cooperate. Um, and accept applications from outside your province, include specific inspection time limits in contracts, uh, complete your testing within reasonable time, and correct issues promptly. This is really a direction to the lab to stop stalling, because um, all of these labs, as I said, they were um, doing things like asking for extra information. They were going slow. Some test centers were only accepting applications from within their province. Um, in fact, most of them were doing that, um, and the CFDA is saying, no, you have to actually engage and do the type testing. Whether uh, this has an effect remains to be seen. Um, the other thing that this uh, uh, edict did was it opened up uh, two possibilities. It said, well, labs uh, are required to accept submissions and applications for doing the traditional type test without charging fees. They have to do this. Um, so that is still there as an option. You can still go and get your type test done, although it still remains to be seen how quickly they will process them. But it also opens up uh, another option um, for the lab to do a contract test um, um, under a commercial arrangement for a fee. Um, and that uh, may now open the door to 
um, fee-based testing for those that wish to pay an additional fee um, and possibly priority fees, which is a bit of a return to what used to happen. Again, we'll see how that works. It was only announced a week ago. Let's just move on to um, the international inspection program. So on December 28th, uh, CFDA published a new draft regulation for overseas inspection of drug and medical device manufacturers. It's a draft, it's still open for comment. I think um, the comment period might be just about to close, but it's still open. It was uh, only published right at the end of last month. Um, and what does it do? It builds on the existing program. So 2015, um, CFDA started doing international inspections, but those international inspections were few and far between, and they were only done on manufacturers or the very highest risk implantables. Now this, this new program extends to all class two devices as well as class threes. So it's a much more broadly based program in terms of the devices covered and the manufacturers to be audited. Um, it includes unannounced audits, surprise audits, um, and so the agency is contemplating doing unannounced international inspections. How that will work is, uh, remains to be seen, particularly when um, uh, auditors who have to travel are going to need to get visas and invitations and so on, so it remains to be seen how the practicalities of that work. Um, it specifies in some detail about the audit team and the processes, so expect that an audit team will be at least two auditors, usually more. The working language of the audit will be Mandarin. That means that there will need to be arrangements for translators and interpreters. Um, that's going to be quite an interesting process. Um, and it sets out details of um, the conduct of the audit, the in fact, the, you know, the, the, how the inspection plan is set up, the initial meetings, the conduct of the actual audit itself, the arrangements for sampling, um, reporting, more reporting, um, and how all of that works. And uh, it specifies reporting and action times. Um, particularly, uh, the auditors have 40 days after their return to China to issue a non-conformance um, report if there are non-conformances. Um, that time limit doesn't uh, include any non-conformances that arise out of subsequent sample testing. Um, uh, and then the manufacturer is given 40 days to respond to non-conformances that are issued. Um, so, moving on, um, international clinical data requirements. Um, this was the other um, announcement, um, and a number of things are in that announcement. So, the uh, first thing is that the data must be um, to, uh, obtained um, in compliance with the Helsinki Declaration and the local country-specific um, code of GCP, which in all practical terms means compliant with ISO 14155. Um, so if you're doing uh, international clinical trials and you're compliant with that standard, then you'll meet this. Um, um, you're required to, of course, have the local um, ethical um, ethics committee requirements met as well. Um, the, uh, there are a set of legal principles that extend on that that says um, the trials must, um, to be acceptable, must be uh, done under GCP, that that quality management that's implemented in the international trial must also be in line with the China GCP, or if you've got some variations, um, and there are some specific additional requirements on China GCP. If you've got some variations, um, specify the differences and guarantee the safety and efficacy. And if you want to hear more about that, um, we do have a slide set on our last webinar um, where we looked at China GCP particularly. You can get that from the from the website. Um, and then the scientific principles. The, 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 it's expected, of course, that the data um, be authentic, um, scientifically reliable and traceable. Um, this is a big deal um, for CFDA. Uh, the, they, are, they have been well aware that there's been a lot of practices that will, shall we just say, are were not optimal. Um, in the pharmaceutical space, about two years ago, um, CFDA announced an amnesty um, and said, uh, we know there are a lot of non-compliant trials um, or data submitted that didn't comply with requirements. If you feel that you would not stand up to an audit, then um, feel free to deregister your medicine and we will ask no more questions. And quite a lot of red medicines were quickly deregistered in China because of um, data that was perhaps um, not obtained from reliable sources. We'll just say that. Um, the data need to be complete, 
not screened, not selective. They do want to see the full primary data set and the study design must be adequate for the purposes. Um, so this is nothing new. This is exactly the same sort of requirements that apply in other major markets. Um, but now CFDA is opening up the uh, possibility of accepting international data. Um, they uh, specify in the guidance what needs to be in the submission. Um, at a minimum, you need to be sending the full protocol, uh, the ethics committee uh, opinion um, confirming the, the approval, um, and the full clinical trial report with an analysis inclusion um, based on the complete clinical data set. Um, they talk about how they're going to review these. Um, they will look specifically at any technical differences between OF overseas and CFDA requirements. Um, uh, they will look at epidemiological factors, race, gender, smoking and drinking, disease incidence, all of those sorts of things. In other words, is the trial population relevant to what goes on in China? And that's going to be the big one. Um, and they'll also look at clinical practice, um, clinical trial conditions and differences, for example, the facilities, the researcher ability, how that relates to what goes on in China. Um, just some examples of the sorts of things that might arise. So here's just three three examples. Imagine uh, for devices you might be getting international data from. Pulse oximeter, simple stuff like skin pigmentation differences between Chinese and Western um, populations. Might You might need to address that and show that that doesn't make any difference to the function of the device. Um, Genetic testing, um, differences in genetics uh, will be based on ethnicity and clinical trials should consider um, you know, which uh, genes and which mutations are particularly prevalent and relevant to the Chinese population. You're going to need to talk about that in your trial design and your report. Um, here's a specific example. Imagine you're doing a hepatitis IVD. Um, there are nine genotypes of hepatitis, um, A to I, but in China, the most common ones are B, C, and D. So your clinical evidence is going to need to show that your reagents can specifically test for the prevalent variants found in China. So just a couple of simple examples there of the kinds of things that people might need to think about. So let's just summarize all of that. Firstly, CFDA isn't slowing down. I was looking at the uh, CFDA website just a couple of days ago, and they continue to make new announcements every couple of days. It's breathtaking and exhausting in just keeping up with it all. Um, we're doing our best to do so. Um, there are good prospects, I think, now to re for removal of the type test roadblock, um, but there are new risks um, in using international data in terms of you've got to find labs that are going to be able to do this. None of them are going to be experienced in testing against Chinese requirements, um, and you do have to make sure that your, your product technical requirement truly addresses the regulatory guidances and regulatory requirements, otherwise you're going to end up with a, um, uh, problems at the review stage at CFDA, um, and you may even end up having to go and do some additional testing in order to finish your regulatory review. Um, so there are new risks, you need to be aware of that. Expect to have the CFDA pop around sometime. Expect to see them at your place, particularly if you've got a high-risk um, device. They're probably still going to concentrate on those four, but we are expecting to see a rollout of this international audit program. Now, uh, China is certainly uh, an observer at the, in the MDSAP program. We don't know if they're going to really get involved in relying on MDSAP audits, but we are expecting to see them become more active internationally in auditing. Um, international clinical data may now substitute for in-China trials. Um, that may be a big thing because a lot of devices require in-China trials at the moment, but you are going to have to be able to show that the international data address the Chinese population and address clinical practice, and that is not going to be easy to do. Um, and simply expect more change. There is going to be more and more change. It's going to continue to go on. Now, before we move to the um, questions and answers, um, I just want to say, if you uh, need to learn more, a little commercial here, um, register for this, the Asia Pacific Device Summit. Um, two events here. We're going to do this event twice. Um, it's happening in Europe um, shortly in February, first, second in Zurich, and in the United States, in uh, Yorba Linda, California, just outside Los Angeles. Um, 
this is a two-day deep dive into regulatory, current regulatory requirements and uh, practices across the Asia Pacific. We'll have local experts uh, practicing in China, in uh, India, in Australia and New Zealand, in Southeast Asia. Um, all uh, speaking over two days, getting into the depth of medical device and IVD, uh, registration, testing, reimbursement, and clinical requirements. Um, it's really something not to be missed. I highly recommend it. Register for this. It's uh, quite inexpensive. Um, Asia Pacific Device Summit is the website. You can see it there. Um, just Google Asia Pacific Device Summit. You'll find it, um, and we'd hope to see you there. So it's uh, time for questions and answers. I would say that the uh, the webinar is being recorded, and we will put it up as a, a video on the um, the website and uh, on our YouTube channel, along with a copy of the slides. Um, but we'll do the Q and A now. If you do think of something later, ask us by email. Email help at brandobiomedical.com. So um, we've got a bunch of questions here. Um, uh, Junhua, um, I'm just going to uh, bring Junhua back online. Junhua, you are uh, available now. Yes. Yes. Hello. So I'd just like to introduce Junhua Shang. Um, she's sitting in Beijing, um, uh, works out of our um, Beijing office, uh, supporting uh, our, our clients directly in China and um, interacting with the CFDA. Um, a, a set of um, questions here. Um, James asks, uh, 87 new revised standards from 2017, are there centralized databases or access points? Junwa, how do we find out the current list of standards and guidances? Well, there's a um, kind of um, uh, trend that CFDA will continue um, reviewing those standards and update those standards um, in an accelerated step. Uh, it is because um, the current use standards in China are old and need to be revised mm -hmm. according to the international um, level, international standards. So I think that's the only um, three standards we can see mm -hmm. being updated. It will have more in the future. Yeah. Do they publish a list of what, which, which are the current standards? How do you know what standards apply in China? Well, there's a regular announcement, and we need to check on the uh, CFDA website mm -hmm. and Reddit Standards website to see the updated version. So you you go to the China Standards website for the current versions, um, but is there a list on CFDA's site anywhere that says these are the standards we recognize, or is it particular well, devices? So well, CFDA um, has the uh, intention to publish those updated standards, but at this moment, we have to go to the uh, stores to purchase those uh, updated right. standards. So, and so the content of those standards are still uh, not open to the public. No. So, but there's so there's no CFDA list. It's a matter of looking at guidances for individual devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Danica asks the question, what about abolishing in-country type testing? Uh, if, if this um, Order 650 um, revision is finalized, do you expect that that will be an immediate change or will there be a transition period? How will that be implemented? Well, it still um, depends on the final version of uh, the CFDA regulation. Mm -hmm. But at this moment, our expectation is that there's going to be some uh, transition period for the, especially the international manufacturers to um, react on those uh, new changes. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll be a, there'll, there'll still be a bit of a require a time where you will have to use in China trials, and then there'll be some period where you can convert over to opt for other approaches. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it remains to be seen. I must say that um, in my experience, CFDA does have a habit of um, doing their uh, proposal and then suddenly announcing and saying, okay, here's the final and it's going to apply from tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to see if they, if they do that. But I think for the Order 650, this is a big revision. Um, it'll be phased in. Although when uh, it was published in 2014. I think there was a fairly short uh, implementation period, so we'll see. Um, now, um, 
Gary Burgess. Um, Gary, hello. We um, here in Australia says, um, do we know when this is going to happen? Um, do we actually have an idea when we might expect to see CFDA um, to uh, implement the change? Uh, how long does it take for them to do the internal thinking before they'll publish the final version? Well, that's a kind of interesting question because um, based on our previous experience, it might take several months or even more than a year for CFDA to make a final decision on the very important draft. Mm -hmm. For As you know, for Order 650, it's a very important uh, regulation in China. So I guess probably it still take uh, some time for CFDA to make the final decision. That can be uh, a couple of months more okay. or uh, even longer. Okay, so the it was announced, uh, the draft was published, I think, October 28th. Um, and uh, yeah. so uh, there was a one month, uh, the consultation closed end of November. So yes, yeah, some months yet for them to do that. So Gary, don't know exactly, but um, it's not gonna happen immediately, I don't think. Um, now, uh, a question from Stephanie. Um, Stephanie says, does the test house used need to be accredited to conduct testing against the Chinese standards? Can we talk a bit about that? Um, the current arrangement um, where the, the test houses are approved and how that works and, and how it might be worked, uh, how it might work with use of international ha test houses. Um, what sort of accreditation requirements should you have? Well, according to uh, CFDA current um, regulation, uh, we have to choose the qualified, the credited test house to conduct the local type testing. And even in the new draft, uh, CFDA mentions a specific uh, qualification of those uh, test house mm -hmm. uh, we're going to uh, use. But firstly, it has to be um, the test house with appropriate GLP. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has to be the um, the test house can conduct according to the local Chinese standards, and that's the very basic requirements. Okay, okay. So that's like uh, the, the China equivalent of GLP um, or ISO 17025 or something like that, depending on the nature mm -hmm. of the laboratory. Um, and international labs, the same thing. You would expect to see somebody who's accredited to the local version of GLP under the OECD arrangements. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, using using an accredited lab, it's basically the same as if you were taking data to the United States FDA or to a European notified body. They'd want to see you using an accredited um, uh, GLP compliant laboratory. What about use? Of, can I just ask a supplementary to that myself? What about use of in-house data? Do you do you think that um, in-house data are going to be acceptable as uh, even in part? Well, um, in the 650 draft, uh, we can see there's the, the option that that accepting the in-house data, but it has to be uh, the qualified uh, uh, data because, um, you know, CFDA is concerned on the, uh, the qualification and the, the local standards, which is called a product technical requirement. Mm -hmm. And all the Chinese local standards and industry standards has to be um, maintained in that documents mm -hmm. and uh, accordingly reflected in the in-house data. So that's the key concern. So um, if you're doing an extensive in-house test, presumably you'd, you'd need to be using an accredited laboratory. I know some large manufacturers have accredited laboratories within their own facilities. Um, but I presume that you could include small amounts of data which are, for, for example, if you've got a, a particularly unusual test because of the nature of your device or you're doing a particular functional animal model which you do in your own facilities um, where, where you couldn't easily source that testing from an external accredited laboratory, um, you may be able to include that sort of specialist data um, under slightly different controls. You'd still have to show the data were obtained under control conditions, but I presume that would be a, the sort of thing you could do as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just look, see who else we've got here. Um, Sandy says, um, do we expect testing requirements to remain the same or a shift in requirements become more in line with USA and EU or ISO 
um, test requirements and specifically 10993. Um, I, I might take that question myself, Junhua, um, particularly on the ISO 10993 part. Um, I think uh, the agency uh, has been working to uh, move closer to international standards in a number of areas. Um, this uh, program of 500 standards in five years is meant to address some of those differences. A lot of the China standards are older versions of ISO standards, and so they're updating them to the current versions and bringing them into line with ISO. So I think that program is going to have the effect of aligning Chinese standards more closely with ISO requirements. Also, review practices. Um, the CFDA, certainly the implantable division, um, now accepts clinical uh, preclinical data obtained outside of China. They've been doing that for a while anyway, so they, they no longer require direct in type testing um, for biocompatibility. Um, and they do accept the ISO. And they have, the reviewers are aware that some of the China biocompatibility standards actually are, are old versions that the ISO has moved on um, and they still haven't updated the China one. The reviewers are aware of that and they are prepared to um, look at testing done against the, the current ISO rather than the old China. So there is some flexibility there. Um, but Junhua, can I come back to you and say, um, what do we expect here? Do we expect to see more um, across the board, China, China testing requirements becoming more internationalized, more aligned with the current ISO? Yes, that's the general trend. Um, CFDA, as we uh, mentioned previously, CFDA has paid uh, a lot of attention on those uh, obsolete uh, standards used currently in China. Uh, international standards is um, widely accepted globally. So China is, um, is going to catch up with the rest of the countries in the world. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Andrea says, uh, Andrea is being a little skeptical here. Do you really believe unannounced international inspections will be implemented? Um, and how much notice do you currently get? Um, what do you think, Junhua? Is CFDA really going to turn up in the car lot without telling you? Are they going to turn up on your doorstep with unannounced? Will that happen? Yes. Actually, um, in, in the last two months, in uh, November and December, CFDA has uh, published several announcements uh, regarding the uh, result on their uh, global QMS on-site audit. And they found lots of um, unqualified items, mm -hmm. uh, non-conformity, actually. And uh, they send out the notice to those uh, manufacturers right away and ask for the corrective actions okay. accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then, um, as far as I know, two manufacturers has now forced to temporarily stop their imports into China mm -hmm. uh, just because they failed on certain items and can't be uh, corrected uh, right away. So things can happen in that direction. Okay. But ha have they done any unannounced? Have they done audits where they didn't, uh, you know, a surprise, what do they call it, a flight audit? Has that been done internationally? Yes. That uh, has been mentioned in a certain uh, notice released from CFDA. So they will do that more in the future, the unannounced inspection or audit. And we think that will happen internationally. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll wait and see, Andrea. I'm not sure. Um, how much notice do you currently get? If, if, it's an, if, if it's a scheduled audit, how much notice does CFDA give? Do you know? Uh, based on my information, seven notices have been sent out. Yeah. No, no, sorry. The time period before they come, how much uh, advance notice will oh, you give? You mean, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That should be a couple of months because they need some time yeah. to prepare the visa and prepare the uh, agenda. Okay. So the answer is a couple of months. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Terry has a question. It's completely changing direction. Um, will the CFDA extend its coverage into Hong Kong anytime soon? Do we have any idea about that? Um, Hong Kong currently has a completely separate regulatory system. It operates a, a, a simple notification system most of the time. Are we expecting CFDA to extend its tentacles to control what goes on in Hong Kong? 
Um, based on our information, um, in the very short term, CFDA doesn't have such intention. We, we don't know about the longer term, and I think that's difficult to predict. So, Terry, the answer is not yet, um, not with no, no immediate plans. Um, so, uh, moving on, um, let me see. Uh, uh, so, Zhuan Shen asks a question for IVD assays based on new technologies for which there is no current or proper standard in China. Is CFDA doing anything to facilitate the review process, um, for example, allowing expedited paths, more interactive reviews, or uh, seeking external expert consultations, etc.? What about new technologies like that for where there is no standard? I mean, it's not just IVDs. Anything where there's no current China standard, what can you do? Is the is the how does CFDA deal with that, and is there opportunity for talking to them? Well, normally when there's no specific uh, Chinese standards, um, the normal practice is to quote the international standards to uh, provide the proof of the product safety and efficacy. Mm -hmm. So if there's no China standard, you can go to an ISO standard. Um, what if there's no ISO standard, if it's completely new, what do you do then? And normally there are certain standards developed by the manufacturer itself. Mm -hmm. Then that standard, those standards can be used as well. So you have to justify your own in-house standards and present those data in the PTR? Exactly. Okay. And per perhaps go and get some external testing against your standard? Yes. The type test center. Okay. Thank you. Um, Question here from, from Julie. Uh, this is the big question. Okay. All those additional reviewers, are they going to review? Is that going to reduce review times? Um, how quickly and how, and how short will they become? Any idea, Junghua? Are we expecting this to have an effect shortly or is it going to take some time for those reviewers to train up? Yes, it's going to take some time for those reviewers to be familiar with everything. But the key purpose of uh, recruiting extra reviewers is uh, CFDA wants to catch up with their uh, schedule because previously there's lots of delays, unexpected delays during the technical review mm -hmm. and uh, making decisions. So now the extra reviewers will help CFDA to uh, maintain their, their uh, announced schedule. So, uh, in the in the first instance, it's not so much shortened reviews, but reviews that actually meet timelines. Because at the moment, they tend to run yes. a bit longer. Okay. Yes. But it, it it certainly I was amazed when we did that training course. Uh, we've done that training course a number of times, and typically in the past we've had you know uh, we had a, a dozen or so review, reviewers come in for a fairly small group. This had more than a hundred in the room, and most of them seem to have come out of university the previous week. Um, so the the agency certainly is and I think still adding large numbers of reviewers um, and very keen to um, to understand international practice and to adopt it. So I, I'm hopeful of um, good changes. Um, let me just see. We've got some more questions here. Another one from um, Danica um, who asks, if international test data and clinical t data can be used, is that going to mean that review timeframes are going to be longer? Uh, that's a good point. Is CFDA going to be more cautious in reviewing international data and therefore take longer compared to reviewing a type test report from the BIMT, for example? Well, uh, from the uh, current practice, uh, CFDA will have um, more uh, new data to be reviewed, but actually they will keep um, their promise for 60 or 90 working days mm -hmm. for the first round um, dossier review. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably using more uh, international data, um, which are not quite uh, be, uh, familiar with those um, uh, uh, safety reviewers, then probably it will have more questions during the supplementary notice. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, CFDA reviewers might give you a longer list for the uh, supplementary documents. It's uh, certainly that, yeah, that's a review tactic used everywhere, isn't it? If you don't know, just ask more questions. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that means that you will take more time to answer those questions okay. and prepare additional documents. 
<laughs> okay, thanks for that. That that yeah, I think that that doesn't surprise me. Um, so perhaps uh, they will uh, do do their part on time, but give you more homework. Um, okay, uh, Tony asks a question. How do you find out who are the accredited laboratories? Um, let's just start with current under current arrangements. If you're doing a China type test, how do you how do you find out which lab to use? It really depends on the product itself. So certain accredited labs in China uh, have certain uh, qualifications to take certain uh, uh, kind of type testing. Mm -hmm. And is there a list of labs and what the qualifications are, or is that something? Yes. That you, yeah, yeah. Yes. On the um, you can you can find those information on the CFDA website. They have a long list with the qualified. Um, uh, local tester houses. Okay, we, we might dig out that link, Junhua, and send it off to everybody afterwards if you want to go and look at the list of, <laughs> of type tests, we'll, okay. we'll email it to the, 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 um, the attendees. Um, so let me just see, uh, I'm just looking, there's a whole load of law list of questions, I'm just checking I haven't missed any. Um, so um, James asks another question, says, uh, is the uh, is the review department divided into device types or specialties in the same way that the US FDA has different divisions? Um, how does it work at CFDA? CFDA also have various departments uh, to handling different uh, products. So it's like active device, non-active device, IVD, etc. Yeah, and I think that was reorganized recently, wasn't it? So the number of divisions increased. Yes. Yeah, so. uh, for instance, uh, what we just discussed about international uh, on-site audit. Mm -hmm. So there's the separate uh, newly set up uh, division to handling this issue. Okay. Okay. And and but the but the number of review divisions at CMDE was also, I think. Um, uh, increased because of the new workloads and they've they've separated that but yes there, there are there, there are different departments for different types of devices um, mm -hmm. uh, Danica asks are there opportunities for overseas manufacturers to contact reviewers directly or is it still do you need to still have an in-country representative to be the contact how does that work who will CFDA speak to and who will they not well CFDA is still expecting the representatives to be the contact person, mm -hmm. other than the direct contact from the uh, overseas uh, manufacturers. Okay, so it's it's the person who owns the uh, who is the nominated representative on the application. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. So, so yes. It's, and that and that's the same in in just about every jurisdiction I'm aware of. Is that is that um, you have to be the applicant to talk to the agency. It's certainly the case in here in Australia, um, and it's the case in the U.S. Um, it's a case if you're dealing with any simply for for confidentiality reasons as much as any. So, Danica, I think the answer is it's still your nominated local representative. Uh, there's nothing to stop that local representative. Um, having you on the phone with them, but um, they need to be the contact point. Um, uh, Rudra um, asks, is clinical data, by which he means both literature and clinical trial, is that mandatory when you're drafting a clinical evaluation report for a device to be introduced into China? Can we talk a bit about the clinical evaluation uh, report and what needs to be in that? So that's the question. What, what do you need to have there? Do you need to have clinical, direct clinical trial data, literature, how does that work? Uh, well, there are a couple of uh, different uh, channels to prepare the uh, clinical evaluation report. So some products are listed on the clinical exemption list, then it can be um, skipped for the local clinical trials uh, under the current regulation. So literatures and uh, and the practical, uh, clinical practical data uh, or supportive uh, evidence to show the uh, product safety and efficacy. And for uh, certain, for, for this kind of products listed in the clinical exemption list, there's also the requirement to compare uh, the uh, predicated product as well. And for the products not listed on the exemption list, 
then probably you will consider to do the local clinical trials in China and also prepare the uh, other evidence like uh, searching for the uh, appropriate predicate mm -hmm. uh, comparison and also uh, prepare, uh, use the uh, keyword to filter in the uh, literature database. Mm -hmm. So this is very much uh, coming into line with international practices now. So similarly in Europe under the MedDev guidance, you would have, uh, you now have to produce um, a clinical evaluation which speaks to both uh, the literature to predicate devices and to direct clinical data on higher risk devices. And I think that's pretty much the effective requirement in China, isn't it? That um, uh, if you're exempted you st from clinical trial, you still need to have a clinical evidence package in your regulatory submission. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Julie asks a question, is there a list of non-China uh, qualified test houses and I think the answer to that is no CFDA doesn't have such a list um, but you need to um, y you would need to uh, identify laboratories uh, in in your own geography in your own country um, and that depends on uh, how those labs are managed under accreditation schemes nationally certainly if I was here in Australia I would say if you want to find a test house you go to the NATA website which is the laboratory accreditation organization and they have a list of all the accredited labs in Australia and there will be similar arrangements in other countries um, but CFDA doesn't um, have anything to say about particular test houses overseas it just requires that they be accredited that's correct Jinhua? Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, and Dan says, uh, and I agree, um, you mentioned that CFDA are hiring fresh college grads as reviewers, how can they perform the job? Um, I think that's true in any agency, um, uh, they, re they hire new reviewers, it, it's going to depend on the training, isn't it? And certainly, um, they're certainly very committed to training, you know, we spend a full day with them just doing biocompatibility um, from a, a lot of fairly eminent experts in, in the field um, and they're doing that sort of thing on a, a range of fronts. So I think, Dan, um, the answer is training. Uh, how, how long do you think, Junhua, before those reviewers start to come online and, and be doing active reviews? Well, actually, they gradually uh, join the evaluation team because, you know, currently CFDA uh, adopt the uh, group uh, review system. Uh -huh. So for high risk product, uh, there will be more than one reviewer to review certain application. So during this process, they can learn from each other. Right, and it's a kind of on the job training. Okay, so it's, they, they, they've moved, to, I recall seeing that, that uh, one of the changes to their process indeed was to go to this team-based approach for reviews. So you've got a, both a larger number of people working on a review, which should help, but also it works as a team. Everybody knows what's going on and you can support the more junior reviewers in that process so that they can contribute in that way. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Now, um, yeah, one final question um, on, uh, this is from uh, Tracy, says, um, okay, what happens if I get an international inspection and I can't complete uh, my report on the audit nonconformity in the 40 days required? Are they going to fail me? What, what, what happens if you, you get a nonconformance and it's going to take you more than 40 days? How do you deal with that? Well, if manufacturers can't complete all the items within the defined time frame, uh, that's 40 working days. Uh, manufacturers should submit a very detailed report on the defect uh, rect rectification process and uh, a follow-up action plan. Then they should also provide a kind of um, related updates until full implementation of the rectification rectification within the, the defined time frame. Okay, so it's pretty much like everywhere else. You must respond within the 40 days, but that response may be that it's going to take longer than 40 days, and here's how we're going to do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that's all of our questions. Um, it's been a, a, an interesting discussion, a lot of really good questions there. Um, as you can see, there's a great deal going on in China, and it's going to continue on at a pace. So um, um, I'd, I'd again recommend that you um, consider the Asia-Pacific Device Summit. Um, go to that website, asiapacificdevicesummit.com, and look at registering for that. We can get a much more detailed um, review over a two-day uh, deep dive into Asia-Pac regulation.
Um, if you found this webinar useful, um, please follow us. Um, we have our own website, web, um, brandwoodbiomedical.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and um, review our YouTube channel um, uh, where the this particular webinar and uh, there's a library of our pri previous webinars with the videos and the slides um, available for download. Um, thank you for your attention and um, we'll look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you, Junhua, for all of your um, um, input and um, good morning to you all or good evening. <laughs>